An eight-person crew is on a mission to reignite the sun with a bomb the size of Manhattan Island. Before they can complete their task, something horrible happens on board the ship. The year is 2057. The Earth is slowly beginning to freeze over. The sun is dying, and the ecosystem is ruined. Earth sent a spaceship named Icarus-1 to the sun in 2050, but the mission failed. Seven years later, Icarus-2 was launched into space along with eight astronauts on board. They are carrying a bomb, which is equal in size to Manhattan Island. After spending 16 months in space, Icarus-2 was getting closer and closer to the dead zone. This is where radio communications to Earth are no longer possible. Every crew member makes the last message they would send to Earth, but Kappa has difficulty deciding what to say to his family. He spends too much time in the recording room, so Mace, who was supposed to go in after him, can no longer send a message to his loved ones on Earth. A fight between Mace and Kappa break out, and the other members of the crew separate the men. Later, Mace apologizes to Kappa for attacking him. Here, they come across Icarus-1, or whatever is left of it. Icarus-2 was near Mercury when it picked up the distress beacon of Icarus-1. Because Icarus-1 was in the dead zone, all of the distress signals they sent to Earth never reached the planet. However, because Mercury has an iron core, it acts as an antenna, so the signal that Icarus-1 sent was amplified by the core and intercepted by Icarus-2. The crew inside the ship is negotiating whether or not to commandeer Icarus-1. Kappa is for commandeering the nearly destroyed spaceship. He reasons that since the last missile materials on Earth have been used to make the giant bomb, and since two payloads have a better chance of success than one, Captain Canada should change the course of Icarus-2 and commandeer the vessel. Mace opposes Kappa's proposition, saying it would be too risky. Trey, the navigator, creates a new trajectory that would allow the spaceship to intercept Icarus-1. However, while he was doing this, he forgot to realign the shields protecting the ship from the sun. His error damaged four shield panels. If the crew doesn't repair them soon, the sun will destroy the ship and take the eight crew members down with it. Kaneda and Kappa volunteer to go outside and make the necessary repairs to save everyone. To assist them in this perilous journey, Cassie, the pilot, makes sure to angle the shields away from the sun to protect Kaneda and Kappa. They realize that this repair mission would destroy the two communications towers, but what they didn't expect was the powerful beam of reflected light. This destroyed the oxygen garden and the oxygen reserves on board the ship. The ship's botanist, Corazon, is horrified at the realization. After that, the ship's autopilot takes over and begins realigning the shields to their original position. While Canada makes the last repairs on the ship, he ordered Kappa to retreat to safety. Kappa knows that he will die and urges him to come back with him, but Canada doesn't listen. He is burned alive in a matter of seconds, breaking the crew's video connection inside Canada's suit. When Kappa comes back to the ship, he can barely cope with the loss of Canada. Communications officer Harvey is the new acting captain. The ship's psychiatrist, Searle, realizes that he is a suicide risk and sedates him heavily. But there's another problem facing the crew. They don't have enough oxygen to deliver the bomb, so their only choice is to dock Icarus-1. Kappa, Searle, Mace, and Harvey board Icarus-1 and they search inside it. Inside, the ship's mainframe has been sabotaged, so the delivery of the payload was impossible. However, there's still a lush and overgrown oxygen garden and the ship's systems are all operational. On the ship's log, there's a message from Pinbacker. He was the captain of Icarus-1 and he is rambling about how he has to abandon his mission. His face is burned from sun exposure and the message was made about six and a half years ago. Inspecting the inside of the ship even further, they find the crew in the observation room. Their bodies have all been burned and charred by the immense heat from the sun. While the four-person crew was inside, the ships decouple unexpectedly after an explosion. The explosion destroyed the outer airlock on Icarus-1, leaving the four crew members stranded. They only have one spacesuit, so Kappa puts it on because he is the only one capable of operating the payload. The other three crew members try to wrap themselves in the insulation material found inside Icarus-1, 
and using the vacuum release for propulsion, they jettison between the airlocks. However, to do this, one person has to stay behind and operate the airlock with his hands. Searle volunteers to operate the airlock, sacrificing his life so he could spare the lives of the other three astronauts. The three men are shot into open space, and they make it back to the ship, but not Harvey. He misses the airlock and freezes to death in the vacuum of space. Left alone, Searle does what he's been doing the entire length of the mission. He goes into the observation room and exposes himself completely to the full light and heat of the sun, unobstructed by an AI assistant like he did in Icarus 2. The group makes some calculations, and they find out there is enough oxygen on board the ship for four people to make the journey. However, there are five of them on board the ship. After a vote, they decide that Trey should be sacrificed to successfully complete the mission. They order Mace to kill him, but before they can do so, the crew finds out that Trey committed suicide. The crew is finally relieved. After everything that's happened, they have enough oxygen to reach the sun and complete their mission. Kappa is talking to Icarus, and the AI assistant informs Kappa that they will not have enough oxygen on board the ship for the journey. They have 19 more hours to go, but there are only 16 hours of oxygen left for the five people on board. Puzzled, Kappa asks Icarus to clarify why he said five instead of four people. Icarus tells him that there are five people on board the ship, and that the fifth person is located in the observation room. Kappa immediately goes to see who is hiding in the observation room, and is shocked at what he sees. Pinbacker, with a burned face and a disfigured body, appears out of nowhere. At that moment, Kappa realized that he was behind the decoupling of the airlocks between Icarus 1 and Icarus 2. After a fight in which Pinbacker wounds Kappa, the young physicist flees into the airlock. While inside, Pinbacker locks his side, and now Kappa is trapped. Pinbacker is now free to go after the remaining crew members. The first one he kills is Corazon. He then removes all of the mainframes from inside the coolant baths, and the ship's power and computer shut down. He is now going after Cassie. Mace finds out that the four mainframes have been removed, and he tries to get them back into the freezing water. When he goes down to install the third one, his leg gets caught, and he freezes to death. Luckily, the power came back on. With his last dying breath, he begs Kappa to complete the mission. That's when Kappa separated the bomb from the ship by blowing up the airlock. Inside the bomb, Kappa tries to get close to Cassie, but they are both attacked by Pinbacker. He tells Cassie and Kappa that in the past seven years, he has had a talk with God, aka the Sun, and he vowed to deliver humanity to heaven. But before this sadistic villain could do so, Kappa escapes by ripping the skin on his arm. Cassie then tells Kappa to ignite the bomb, but he's not sure the bomb will work in extreme conditions. Thankfully, the bomb ignites and kills both Cassie and Pinbacker. As the bomb draws near the surface of the sun, time and space begin to mold together. In his final moments, Kappa reaches out and touches the sun with his bare hands before being consumed by it. Back on Earth, Kappa's sister is watching his video message while her sons are making a snowman near the frozen Sydney Harbor. At that moment, the sun spreads its rays on the Earth once again, deeming the mission a success. Subscribe for more videos like this, and turn on the notifications bell so you never miss any of them.